Welcome to season one, episode one of the Radical Narrative Podcast. This episode, the first episode of the season, goes to Miss Tennille Campbell. We sat down a few weeks ago to discuss PhD life, academia, and COVID times, and her writing. So stay tuned and listen in. Yeah, so welcome. Glad you could sit with me finally. We've been planning this podcast for a while. I've been playing hard to get. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you have been. <laughs> it's so hard to get a hold of people these days in general. Well, you know, COVID. Yeah, COVID. <laughs> and speaking of COVID, we're recording under COVID circumstances, right? We're sitting in a public space, uh, socially distanced, and playing it safe. Six feet apart. One buffalo apart. Mm. One plane's buffalo apart. Like two beaver apart. <laughs> <laughs> sprawled beaver apart <laughs> yeah so i really wanted to get you on this podcast because you're doing some unique work um you're doing some unique work just in terms of writing you're also a phd right you do finishing your phd mm-hmm. um we both are we could probably have unpack some of that because mm-hmm. we've been doing this for too long too long um and it is kind of the season i find it's the season of going back to school but no one's going back to school right so it's kind of like this weird energy because we've been doing this for a while where we would have to normally go back, get back into that routine, but we're not doing that anymore. I yeah. know. It's just more like rearranging our living room so we don't have the same backdrop on our Zoom classes this year. Yeah, literally. Are you still taking academic classes right now? No, I'm done the academic part, but I'm TAing. So I oh, have okay. to be online like one hour a week and I'm like, do yeah. they need to see my dirty kitchen? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And how's the writing going? um good which which writing yeah well, which that's, writing that's what i kind of want to unpack because you you do multiple forms of writing mm-hmm. right and i think you're really popular in the public eye for your poetry yes. yeah so you do a lot of work um writing that but you also speak a lot about that mm-hmm. yeah um for the listeners who don't know um, I wrote a book called Hashtag Indian Love Poems, which was published in 2017. And it's a beautiful little collection of indigenous love poems. Like the title was pretty spot on. Mm-hmm. But um, based in sensuality, sexuality, erotica, kind of saying all the things we mm-hmm. all talk about, especially the aunties. Yeah. But like putting it on paper. Totally. So I actually don't think I was actually doing anything new at all yeah (laughs) i just think i had the opportunity to publish yeah and since it came out it's just been this really i'm not gonna say invasive (laughs) but like this really no holds barriers down conversation yeah because i think once you start talking about sex there there's very little barriers for sure yeah yeah we we've had conversations around sexuality sexual practice in the past just in terms of how colonialism um has really impacted how we have those conversations and how we practice that mhm and we've always said like i think we've in our social circle we always said that if you want to have a decolonial conversation with a group of people or someone start talking about sex because the bedroom is a very colonized space, right? Behind closed doors is a very colonial notion because mm-hmm. right? there's no there's no closets and teepees, there's no doors and teepees. So sexuality pre-contact was really um, something that we really needed to look more into. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you're doing that with this the, your your poems and your writings, obviously. I hope so. Like when I first first started writing, which is like way back in 2014 for this collection. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, tongue in cheek, I did not know as much about sexuality as I do now. Mm-hmm. Like, it's definitely open doors that I wasn't always ready for. Yeah. But definitely was just like, all right, you started this. Like, what are you going to learn? Mm-hmm. But like back in the day, I was just like, you know, sometimes <laughs> I forgot how I put it. But like, sometimes we just want to talk about dick. Yeah. <laughs> and sure. indigenous women especially never had that stage to just talk about an orgasm for the sake of yeah. an orgasm yeah we never had that discourse or that language of being able to do sex in the city mm-hmm. you know indigenous brown girls did not do casual sex mm-hmm. i'm like but we did and mm-hmm. we do and we continue to do yeah. and for a long time it was like the only way we were allowed mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. to talk about sex in any sort of public was through the identity of trauma. Totally. Or healing from trauma. Yeah. And I was just like, you know, I'm not saying we're all healed at all, at all. Mm-hmm. But we we can we can talk about sex with joy mm-hmm. and laughter. Exactly. And you know, sarcasm and every emotion. Yeah. So I think that's what it was originally meant for. Like just to have this space where we can talk about it in a good way. Mm-hmm. In multiple ways. Yeah. And it's just evolved. Yeah, totally. And and you said it evolved and you said it took you a while to begin to have that conversation, not only with your work, but with yourself. So what was that transition from going to, you know, having this um, sort of like social conditioning to not talk about sex, but then to be in the space now where you're in front of a group of people hmm. on stage reading these, <laughs> these, these poems that are pretty explicit and people are laughing yeah. and people are smirking, even like, you know, grandmas are smirking because <laughs> there's, there's truth to sexuality in our communities, right? There's a truth to it. So. Well, my grandma and grandpa had 13 kids. The babies they came know. from somewhere, right? <laughs> like, they know. <laughs> yeah. I think with me especially, like, growing up in a small town, growing up with brothers primarily, growing up, like, in a Catholic reserve, all these things get layered on that you don't necessarily think of because mm-hmm. you're surrounded by it. And then when you start to kind of, like, delve out into it and be surrounded by people who not are not all brown and Catholic, your world just opens up in a good way, in a good way. And I have to do a lot of like confrontation of my own stereotypes about myself. Like mm-hmm. having a one night stand does not make you a whore. Mm-hmm. You know, having multiple boyfriends or girlfriends does not make you a slut. Yeah. And it was like all these negative connotations that, of course, only women carry. Mm-hmm. You know, I can't speak for indigenous masculinities, but I can say indigenous women carry these labels. Mm-hmm. And I had to unpack that for myself and I had to not carry that shame and I had to be rejected in a lot of ways. Being like, you know what? You can have as much partners as you want. It doesn't matter. As long as there's consent and respect and you have your boundaries. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and it's ethical, right? So there's ethics to this. I think people make the assumption that it's not, right? That it's oh. kind of like taboo to the point of where it's it's sinful, it's shameful, but a lot of these conversations happen ethically in, in, in healthy ways. Oh, yeah. Like, I've had sexual situations where I've, you know, straight up, I'm like, we're not having a drink. You're not smoking any pot. Like, we are going to have this conversation. Like, mm-hmm. do you like this? What's your mm-hmm. safe word? What are your boundaries? Mm-hmm. And a lot of the times it blows people minds. Like, how can you talk about this? I'm like, mm-hmm. would you rather like we be drunk and make a mistake and regret this? Mm-hmm. Or would you rather go into this knowing that we both agree to it and we're both going to have a great time because we both know what's coming? Yeah. Like I've, I've talked so much about consent and about like permission and mm-hmm. about good, healthy boundaries mm-hmm. since, you know, <laughs> Indian love poems that a lot of times it's not even about like me learning. It's just about me listening. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And it's interesting. You get conversations because I remember reading in some of uh, sitting in some of your readings and people even ask you questions, right? Like they (laughs) ask you questions about things that wouldn't normally happen in a regular poetry reading or in some sort of academic conference. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I love it when my academic work and my poetry like collide because people want to be prim and proper and like academic and professional. But, you know, Mm -hmm. how do you say clit in front of the dean? Yeah. (laughs) Right. And I'm like, I'll show you. (laughs) Yeah. You just say it. (laughs) But yeah, yeah, like I said, with sex, like once people read the book, Mm -hmm. I wrote it in a way that it's supposed to sound like your auntie telling stories. Like Mm. it's very straightforward language. It's very tongue in cheek humor. And a lot of times it's self deprecating humor not insulting myself, but like making fun of myself because Mm. I'm the one who's stumbling through all this new knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I wrote it in a way that the people reading it stumble with me. Yeah. So like when we laugh at a joke in the book, we're not laughing at the person I'm sleeping with. We're laughing at the, person reading Mm -hmm. one experiencing in the first person so i think that really opened up the intimacy Mm -hmm. for a lot of readers because like i'll get the dms i'll get the questions at conferences or poetry readings 
mm-hmm. where people want to talk about their own sexual experience and ask me an opinion. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I don't know. You a freak. I'm here for it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Teach me. <Yeah. laughs> like yeah. things like that. And we laugh because like in the early days of poetry readings, when I do it with other poets, you know, I speak with Mika Lafond, another mm-hmm. Saskatchewan Meshkeg based poet. And her poetry is so beautiful. Oh my God, it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. And she just paints a story. I love yeah. her work. So she'd have people coming up to her and asking her about like her inspiration and this word in Cree and like her language throughout. And she'd like tell her story. And then people would come up to me and be like, my boyfriend tied me up last night. <laughs> <laughs> totally different response. Yeah, just after the, the the reading in the same space, you have two different lines forming. Complete <laughs> different lines. Yeah. Yeah, totally. You said something interesting where you said you, you left the community, right? Mm-hmm. That you, And that sort of like impacted, well, not so much impacted, but developed your worldview. Um, I also did that as a, as a college student. I went to school in Santa Fe, New Mexico and other places and had the opportunity to travel. Um, and I find like today in society, indigenous children and young people and students in particular are still struggling with that, like come and go aspect of life. Yeah, I still struggle with it. Yeah. Like I'm 36. I've been off the reserve since I was 18. So half my life. Mm-hmm. And I'll still go home. Like I lived at home for a year um, to have my daughter and raise her when my mom helped me. Best time ever. Mm-hmm. I want to move home. They basically won't let me now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mom's like no no <laughs> why is that because like you're an adult you have a job okay. <laughs> and i'm like, <laughs> like <laughs> living at home on the rest is the goal it is yeah for a lot of people it is i find especially our generation right yeah. like I, we're, and we're in a housing crisis all over obviously it's hard yes. to get homes and trying to navigate that um yeah totally i know Relatable. i know so like yeah jumping between leaving the reserve at 18, going to school, coming back, going to school again, coming back, like this transitional lifestyle. Like to this day, even though I've lived in Saskatoon for like six years, I still feel like it's in transition. Mm -hmm. And I'm just waiting for the time to move back home, like Mm -hmm. I would always do back in the day. So I don't know. Um, But leaving the community and like leaving everyone who thought the same. And like no shade to them. Like it's a very comfortable space. Mm -hmm. Um, it just opens up discussions. It opens up your mindset. It invites such amazing opportunities. Mm -hmm. Not obviously just A, to be a hoe, Mm -hmm. but (laughs) I'll say B, to be a hoe in life. (laughs) I'm trying to make this so secret. (laughs) To be a hoe in life needs to be a tattoo. (laughs) Well, there's very real physical, there's very real physical relationships that develop away from home. When mm-hmm. you leave home, right? Because the fact is, is that um, the the like we're raised and told not to date anyone within a two hundred mile radius because you relate to everybody, right? Like yeah. who who's your mom and dad? Yeah, yeah. And then everyone knows everyone. There's some sort of kinship in place. So there's very 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 real uh, physical reasons to go out and explore the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, but the whole life thing. I meant like opening your mindset to like foods, exactly. adventures, accents, languages. Mm-hmm. Facing your own stereotypes, because even though we're brown, we carry a lot of prejudice towards other cultures, for mm-hmm. sure. And, like, realizing that salt and pepper isn't spicy. <laughs> <laughs> that's a Saskatchewan thing. Like, that's a general Western Prairie Province thing, probably. Because oh. it's interesting how, like, our, our, I wouldn't say so much traditional foods, but the foods that we consume regularly are pretty fa- flavorless. Like, it sort of comes from... A lot of Ukrainian influence, a lot of farmer meal influence. So like pierogies, okay, but meat and okay. potatoes. That's that's prairie. We don't have Ukrainian influence in the north. Oh, true. Yeah, right? let's unpack that because you're, you're <laughs> navigating two spaces here, right? Yeah, because you're like talking about teepees. I'm like, cool. We didn't have them. Yeah. <laughs> I sorry. I just I just um, went uh, Cree supremacy here. I know. I like calling you in your shit. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> old wounds <laughs> um so yeah like we although i'm not going to complain about pierogies like having not grown up with them pierogies like, can stay like yes. when decolonization happens pierogies are ours oh my god yes um but like growing up yes like meat and potatoes or like onions and oh gross onions and liver mm-hmm. my mom was weird but 
I wouldn't say like it was flavorless for us, but it was definitely like safe. Yeah. You know, like garlic powder was astounding. Yeah, totally. (laughs) How dare you? And. And I get I get it like I get it. Mm -hmm. But now having like traveled and eaten and. Mm -hmm. I'm just like, can we please just put some fucking cilantro on something? (laughs) Any fresh herbs in general. (laughs) Right? It's interesting because everybody I had conversations with that is indigenous always talks about food security and food sovereignty without mentioning those words. Mm -hmm. Because we did, many indigenous people did grow up with foods that satiate us, that fill us, Mm. but may not be nutritionally dense. Like, you know, for us growing up, one of the go-to meals was like um, um, ground beef and a can of beans. And you mix that up and eat it with toast. Um, Not much like access to, you know, the spices or access to even uh, seasonal vegetables sometimes. And and we did our best. Mom did our best. But yeah, it's interesting how this food conversation always comes up when we have uh, conversations (laughs) with one another. (laughs) Well, even today, um, I met a friend, an online friend. He was Mm -hmm. going cross country. And she was just like, hey, you want to meet up? I'll be in Saskatoon for the night. I'm like, dope. And so what I did was like I picked up KFC and took her to the river. We had a sunset dinner by the river. And we just ate KFC like old times and just Mm. talked. Never met this woman in my life. But it was Mm. like meeting another best friend. Cool. And this idea of how like food is so central to these relationships. Like you and I are like drinking tea and Mm -hmm. coffee right now. Mm -hmm. And how do you have a conversation without like feeding your body as well as you're feeding your mind? Oh, that's true. That's true. Yeah. I like that. I know. And like, we were real, we were lucky. Like my dad comes from a big family up North. Most of them like stayed in the North. Always had like wild meat and fish about like, we were very lucky. Mm -hmm. Plus my mom was a farmer. So we always had access to like cow and things like that. So we were lucky, but I still remember, like, at the end of the month, you know, that's when dad would get paid. And we'd have, like, giant, like, boxes of apples and bananas and oranges. And it'd have to last us the whole month, like, four grown Mm -hmm. kids. Mm -hmm. And we'd just, like, devour Like, fresh fruit to this day is such still a treat in my mind. Yeah. The way, like, I'm like, okay, cool, moose meat, dope. But have you tried this apple? (laughs) (laughs) Such a contrast, right, for some people. Yeah. I'm like, it's crisp. (laughs) So having access to the traditional foods, but that fresh fruit in the north was like the thing. Yeah, like it's expensive AF. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my mom's from uh, northern Manitoba, and she always tells a story of how they would get like a box of mandarin oranges for Christmas. And it was like such a big deal. Because it would have to come up on the barge or come up on a flight or things like that. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. 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 Because like we, like the north had the bay. Mm-hmm. And then uh, a couple of years ago, like three or four years ago, our reserve built another grocery store up north. Mm-hmm. And the fresh produce takes up less than a wall of this, like mm-hmm. two feet, <laughs> six wow. feet. Right. And. And that's amazing. That's mm-hmm. amazing in the north. And I'm and like we're so privileged. Like we come from the city and we're like, oh, my sushi on the way home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Get your Starbucks. And then we're like, oh, <laughs> you know, milk is like six bucks. Yeah. Dope. Cool. And then you're like produce section and then like they're trying. It's better than it was ten years ago. Mm-hmm. And you're like, okay. I don't have a selection of eight apples. Okay. <laughs> yeah, like tuck it in, Tennille. <laughs> and it's not that fresh sometimes. Mm-hmm. They make their way up there. It takes time. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, it's interesting because me as a res kid too, there's still this dynamic. And like me driving in for this podcast, I was looking forward to eating something in town. Yeah. Yeah, because that's like the thing to do is when you go to town, you get something to eat that you normally can't eat and you enjoy it and you savor it because you might not come into town for a while. Right. So there's always like these select restaurants and the go-to is always KFC or Chinese food for some people. Yeah. But for me, my palate's changed, right? So it's like East Indian food. It's mm. like pho. It's like all these things I experienced with friends going out to eat in college and university. 
So yeah, it's very true that our palates change and, and with that we gain so much more insight and appreciation for the world, insight, insight and appreciation for other cultures and things like that. Totally. I know. And you still have to balance that. Like as this res urban person, I don't know, being teased back home for being too bougie, too mm-hmm. city, too mm-hmm. white. Yeah. Like, how dare you bring that hot sauce into this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. We, we get hot sauce sent to us, um, me and my partner, from uh, friends in the U.S. and, and from... I, I wouldn't even be able to handle it. Like, I could do the sweet chili rooster sauce, mm-hmm. but, like, the actual hot chili rooster, I'm like, no. <laughs> 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 Baby steps. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Yeah, so there, for, for us, it sounds like there is this um, urban-rural divide and struggle mm-hmm. that always exists. That's pretty, well, it's unique to Saskatchewan in general. Is it? Uh, I, I, well, I find that a lot of the people I talk to from the area, there is this aspect of um, our urban-rural divide. And it even shows up in, like, settler politics all the mm-hmm. time, um, that the Western Prairie provinces are out here. There's predominantly conservative people. Ottawa's over there. And, um, like just in the city of Saskatoon, you know, Mayor Charlie Clark has his followers in the city. They're mm-hmm. not like you drive three kilometers out of Saskatoon and it's a whole different political ball game out there. Um, and that also exists for us. I find is that there is like, we're coming and going all the time, but there's also this, like they're, they're appreciated, but they're also different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like same, same, but not. Yeah. Like. Erica Lee, and not, and to like paraphrase her badly, my bad, my bad, but has like reminded me on countless times because she's urban indigenous mm-hmm. and I'm from the Brez. And she's like, this is literally all indigenous land. Mm-hmm. Like the city is still indigenous land. Mm-hmm. And it's really kind of like opened my eyes to what urban indigenous means, mm-hmm. especially for like for her as a Cree woman. And like learning so much because even to this day, I don't consider myself a city Indian unless it's joking. Mm-hmm. But let's be real. Like I know how to, I know how to like order a latte more than I know how to like survive in the bush at this point. Yeah. Lord help me. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And it's like when, I don't know if you do this thing. Like when you travel, you find out whose land you're on. Yeah. Yeah. I do, like, I do that all the time. Like I always question it. I always make a post about it. I go one step further where I never go to a place or a territory that I'm not invited in. And um, I'll actually, I'm not to put that on your shoulders. As I'm like looking at you <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Not oh, to put that on your shoulders. Sacred Indian, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I think it's, it's I mean, it's it's easy to do in okay. the Americas, but I also do it like with how Central America. How does that, how does that like look that. here? How does that look? Give me an example, please. So for me personally, like flying into um, uh, West Coast territory. Okay. I'll, I'll I'll message a friend and be like, "Hey, I'm coming to to your territory." I always ask. Well, I don't ask for a welcome, but I imply, "Let's hang out, let's chill, and can you welcome me so there's no bad juju vibe when I get there?" Type mm. thing, and they're like, "Yeah, cool, man. Come on, come and check it out." And that's that's my welcome to to get into that space. And I have friends all over. They know I do yeah. this, right? So um, New Mexico, same thing. As I'm right? like, I'm not inviting you to the north. <laughs> <laughs> and if you say no, it's cool. I'll probably still go. Just kidding. No. <laughs> If there's settlers listening to this, that's not how you do it. I'm like, that is a joke between two brown people. <laughs> that is like, a joke between stop. two brown people. <laughs> He's always invited. It's fine. <laughs> like, settlers should ask. <laughs> yeah, sh- settlers should ask. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I navigate that that way. Like for me personally, that's just like something that that I've been utilizing and doing lately. Um, and, it, and it's t- taken me to some amazing places in the world. It's like places where I just didn't pop into. It's places where you're invited and you sit with family as you sit and eat. You know, you get to see behind the scenes of a lot of the things that tourists don't get to see. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it ultimately, for me, it makes you like critique cor- tourism on a whole different level because now right. you're seeing the impact, right? right. So, Yeah, I'm not that quite that, what's the word, conscientious? Mm-hmm. That might be the word. English major here, I don't know how to use it. But, like, when I travel through, like, I always kind of know whose land I'm on, even if I have to Google it. Yeah. And, you know, like you, like, friends all over. Mm-hmm. So, like, we were just recently in Vancouver a couple of weeks ago. First COVID airplane. Woo. And we had to do a shoot in Vancouver. And I was like, there's no way, like, me and Maddie, a Cree Métis girl mm-hmm. from Alacrosse, who now lives, like, in Kamloops in Vancouver. And I was like, there's no way we can do this shoot in Vancouver because it involved, like, two Native girls. Mm-hmm building a fire and dancing around it while like traditional Indian music played. Mm -hmm. 
I was like, that's just, that's not going to fly in Vancouver. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so we contacted one of my girlfriends in Chilliwack, who is uh, from the Chiam Nation. I think mm. Stalo. Don't quote me on that one, but from the Chiam mm. Nation. And I was just like, hey, I know you have access to this. I'm going to be in town. Would it be okay if we came mm. with you and you helped us do this so we can use your territory? Because there was no way in hell I was just going to go into the territory, even though there's public beaches and whatnot. Yeah. And do this very emotional session there. Mm -hmm. And like they lit it up for us. Like they wow. showed us where to go. They yeah. brought us there. They introduced us to people. Mm -hmm. They helped us with the fire because we didn't even bring wood. Because <laughs> I was like, it's a forest. <laughs> <laughs> Almost starts a forest fire. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, it's a big forest. <laughs> like, they helped us so much. And then like afterwards, she just texted me. I'm just like, thank you so much. And uh, she was like, yeah, it's a good adventure. Mm -hmm. And this is just all off based off of like a friendship that began five years ago. Yeah. And as I go through her territory, I'm like there's no way I'm going to go through her territory and not say hi. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's really cool. And I think that also just speaks to like the relationships you develop um, as you venture out into the world, as you travel, go on these adventures. I mean, for me, academia really exposed me to a lot of people in a good way, also a negative way, but. We're talking about the good stuff. <laughs> yeah, I'm like one eyebrow. Yeah. Like, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah, and there's also this dynamic that we both are in um, PhD programs. We're mm -hmm. both, you know, finishing our PhDs and working towards that. Yeah, what's your relationship with academia right now? Um, I love a lot of the indigenous people that I've met. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't go to conferences for the, the talks. Yeah. Like, I'm the asshole who will attend one talk and then disappear with people for the rest of the day. Yeah, yeah. Because that's more important to me. Mm -hmm. Like, I do not care what some second year, even though I was a second year at one point, mm -hmm. says about a topic. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't. I don't care. But I care about the friends that I made, like, six years ago now from yeah. my first conference in the Mohawk Nation. Yeah. You know, like, these are the things that keep me in academia mm. but academia itself can like go fuck itself yeah like i'm just at that point where i love how it taught me to critically assess and read and look at mm. the world around me mm -hmm. like i think as indigenous people as a storyteller as a photographer like i had some of the base obviously but it really finessed it into something that i notice a lot yeah good or bad i notice it but it's such a negative space. Mm -hmm. It's such a stereotypical white space. It's Eurocentric, no matter what we try and do. Yeah. And some days I love it. I love learning. I love understanding. I love that moment mm -hmm. of like connection where you like these two crazy ideas and you're like, but this is how they're connected and I get it and I can speak about it and I feel confident in it. Yeah. But then there's other moments that I'm just, I hate it because nobody looks like us and the mm -hmm. more... The higher up you go, the more pale it is. Yeah. And no matter how inviting somebody is, the fact that we have to be invited into something that's already on our land mm -hmm. <laughs> is problematic. Yeah, totally. Yeah, these spaces aren't safe spaces. They're really no. um, conditioned. You have to jump through the hoops to get into them. Yeah, that's a really interesting way you put it. Because for me, like the higher you go in terms of academia, Indian country gets smaller. Yeah. Which means that you know, that there's more white people or there's more non-Indigenous people mm -hmm. in those spaces and the community is smaller because that's who we know <laughs> because mm -hmm. we're now in those spaces together. Yeah, and it's such an interesting time of year too because there's a lot of young students starting their academic careers like, in the time of COVID. <laughs> okay, between you, me, and all our listeners, <laughs> <laughs> I literally would not have recommended kids go to school this year. Mm -hmm. Like if, if my daughter... Who's like, you know, let's pretend she's 18 and going to university and it's all online. Mm -hmm. I'd have been like, why? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm obviously not a digital learner. And then you're teaching, you're teaing an online course. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Are you teeing? <laughs> I am not teeing. I'm not teaching any courses this fall but i agree that i consciously chose not to teach courses this fall mm. and didn't um volunteer or put the word out or any intention to do so because it is going to be a challenging year it is going to be a, a unique year like it's it's something different for like you and i to be like oh 
you know, if we have to attend a seminar, because mm-hmm. this is like our what, 40th year in school. Yeah, we're in like grade 40. <laughs> yeah, like it's great time. <laughs> Nobody do it. Uh, <laughs> but imagine coming like, imagine spending a year like prepping to leave the res mm-hmm. and all the work that that entails. Yeah. And if you're first generation university, which mm-hmm. these kids still often are, mm-hmm. like I was. And finding a place and finding a roommate if you can afford it and applying for bad funding if you get it, applying for student loans if you get it, mm-hmm. scholarships. Like there's so much prep yeah. that people don't talk about. And then everything just gets shut down. Yeah. And now it's just online learning. Mm. But tuition hasn't changed. Tuition hasn't dropped. Exactly. You're not like getting discounts because you can't use the library. You can't use the gym. You can't mm-hmm. use the bus system. Mm-hmm. But... So, like, what are they paying for? And, like, and here's the thing. Like, yes, yes, like you said, I'm a TA. Yes, I want to be a professor one day. But you can still be critical of the system. You can. Like, exactly. it's, we're here to teach. Mm-hmm. And I just, I'm very critical of the way it's set up this year. Yeah, and I think it's really great to be critical of, of, of how academia is structured in general. But this year, it just seems like it's not flexible and they're trying to be flexible, but in that flexibility, there's rigidity and it's not shifting. Um, like I think USAS tuition cut was just like a fraction of a, like like a percent or something. It was like two dollars. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> like- <laughs> so students are paying for this tuition to to take online classes and having taken online classes and taught online classes, they're not the smoothest thing in the world. They're not the mm-hmm. funnest thing in the world. Yeah, and to do that full time for a semester is going to be pretty intense. I'm like. Us being like at the, I don't know, I think I'm in my seventh year. I don't know what you're in. But like, I won't say that on my podcast. <laughs> I will say it, no problem, because <laughs> we have to normalize the fact that PhDs don't always just take four years. I think I'm honestly getting into year six now. That's so fine. Small year six, yeah. I think mine is like, if I hit year 10, cool, it's an anniversary. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't care. <laughs> but like being year seven mm-hmm. of a PhD, like now we know the professors teaching and yeah. we know how hard they're working. Like mm-hmm. I can still see that side of it yeah. for sure. There's so many people who care yeah. so much, but still we could have, I don't know. I don't know the answer, but we yeah. can still be critical. I don't think a lot of people have the answer. I Is think, there an answer? I don't, not for COVID times. I think it's just like people are trying to resort to, what they know within the system and how it's structured, but the system's not flexible. I mean, administration's not um, really doing what they need to do, I feel. But I mean, can you really come together and figure out a solution to teaching students in COVID? I don't, I don't know. know. But then how, like once, you know, creator willing, there's like a cure or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, how are we going to still make this accessible now to kids who have special needs exactly. and learning abilities? Because we can see it's, it's done. Mm-hmm. You know, we had two weeks. We managed to get everything online. Yeah. Um, so how are we going to continue this to make it accessible? Yeah. And it's also like I find that one of the big dynamics that hasn't been addressed is that for that first year student who's coming from an indigenous community or coming from a family as a first um, first generation university mm-hmm. student. I noticed some of them are even staying home to do their first year. Yeah. And I can't imagine that. Like I can't imagine doing a full semester of online classes while living with my same family dynamic that I had prior to starting college. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and so like there's, there's these accessibility issues in general that are, are kind of being, um, not being brought up yet, but I think they will be. I think we will see some students stumble for very real accessibility issues that we should know, but we're just the low bottom of the ladder PhDs that aren't in any position of power to address these things. I'm like, <laughs> we got to stay humble. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that's real. And yep. like accessibility as even to Wi-Fi access. Exactly. Like my res only got the fucking internet six, seven years ago, like data, wireless mm-hmm. internet. Ten years ago? I don't know. It's been a minute. But I mean, I can't ho- hold a Zoom meeting Mm-hmm. If I'm sitting like in the kitchen of my res, yeah, like I just I can't. It'll falter out. It'll mm-hmm. stop. It'll lag. Everything else will. And, you know, that's not even the worst of the North Internet. Like, yeah. there's a very real problem here. Mm-hmm. 
And like the North really does bring up some unique issues that exist specifically for the North, like socially, politically, and education-wise. I know you, I know USASC hasn't been really um, supportive of the North in general, even though a lot of the Indigenous students come from the North. Mm-hmm. Um, their needs aren't being met and, and things like that. I think um, they even shut down some of the Northern points, um, access points to university. Yeah. Yes. Oh, the U of S. <laughs> Let's not talk too much about that because we're both still students there. Yeah, we're both still students there. We're both still <laughs> yeah. navigating it. Still both paying that freaking tuition. Yeah. <coughs> One of the <laughs> things, though, that you mentioned with students is that, that they're going to university, but at the same time, a lot of, like, I, I had Gerald Risner as an undergraduate professor. Nice. Yeah, and, and he's, and it's not the Gerald Risner that the older generation knows because apparently he was a hard ass in, in the past, but for us, he was really laid back and chill. Like, he was already retired. He was teaching for fun. So a lot of the advice <laughs> that he, must be nice. It was nice. <laughs> and a lot of the advice he gave me, I really utilized where, you know, he's saying um, he basically gave me a lot of good intellectual ideas. But he's also saying said to, you know, enjoy the ride of what you're doing and 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 things like that. And um, he said very interestingly that a lot of the reason why well, the reason he joined the military was uh, to get out of the reserve, to get yeah. off the reservation and get access to the world. And we had conversations where I said, you know, part of me going to want to get my degrees was for me to get access to the world, to leave my community and, and venture out. So a lot of these first year students are, aren't necessarily thinking in terms of I'm going to be a Ph.D. professor one day. It's also just a way of saying I'm going to change the world I'm living in right now by experiencing something different. For real. For real. Like so many like memories you just triggered with that. Like, my brother and I, like, I have three brothers, two older, one younger. Mm-hmm. And the one younger than me is, like, only 11 months younger than me. So he's an idiot. I love him. <laughs> yeah. But, like, we fight like cats and dogs. And we get along. But at one point, um, he was going towards something schooling-wise. Like, mm-hmm. school. He's more into music and art than school. Mm-hmm. And we had this conversation. And he's like, Tanila, you can't change the world. And I was like, watch me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, but I was like laughing because I was like, tell like changing the world isn't going to be about like changing a law or anything like that. Because mm-hmm. what do I know about that? I'm mm-hmm. like, but it's like being an example. It's like every day I wake up and I'm like, even if it's trouble, even if it's like middle of COVID, even if it's like mm-hmm. full moon time, like whatever. I'm like, I still kind of like love my life. And even mm-hmm. that, like finding the joy and giving yourself the permission to like follow your passion and love your life. Like that's revolutionary. Yeah. Especially with our people. Yeah. And his, he was like, so you're happy. That's how you're changing the <laughs> world. I'm like, yes, bitch. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's true. That like, de- happiness is a very decolonial act. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Uh, yeah. Yeah. For me, I experienced a lot of anti-intellectualism from people. Um, and it's been coming up more so recently, um, I find, simply because I'm working more in communities. Um, but the big irony in that is I'm working in communities, and some of the people who are critiquing me aren't, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, um, but, I mean, it's, I'm definitely in a space where I'm happy. It's stressful at times with academia, yeah. right, obviously. But it's definitely, like, I don't imagine myself being in any other space right now because it is a unique path that has its rewards and opportunities that other people may not have had access to. Completely, like... We both just side at somebody. <laughs> um, I like. I should also mention, like, I'm in year seven because halfway through my degree, mm-hmm. I switched my topic completely, yeah. <laughs> and that's to start all over again. But that's because like life happens, my passions change, yeah. and I just couldn't advocate for myself and my team. Rightly, couldn't advocate for me to continue on the same path, mm-hmm. and allowed me to like change my thesis and topic into something that more reflected my work now which yeah. is indigenous erotica mm-hmm. and i was like um i can study this yeah. <laughs> like at this level what yeah. and it's like a real thing and i've been like very lucky that in of course academia world indigenous academia world lots of support um but you know taking this topic home of indigenous erotica and literature to the reses you know how does how does that look how does that come across we're still dealing with you know influx of christianity catholicism religion patriarchy colonialism and how do we bring this topic because like 
I don't think you, nor do I, do this for, you know, white scholars Mm -hmm. or even indigenous scholars. Like, I'm doing this so that my daughter has an easier time. I'm doing this for my nieces to have an easier time. For, like, this discourse and this discussion to already been had and in place so that they're not starting from zero. Yeah. For sure. It's like the embodiment of what we're trying to do is, is to facilitate and create change. Um, and that's an embodiment. Like I said, it's an embodiment of, of us holding the space and moving forward in that. Like I just did a online, my, one of my first online um, workshops with like 87 students who are starting college at YTC today. Ooh. And it went good. It, was really, it went really smooth and I'm really happy with it. But I, I kind of had imposter syndrome this morning of like, what am I going to say to these kids? And what, who am I to tell these kids about university and things like that? But when I got into that space, it was really cool. And I received a lot of positive feedback simply by, you know, having experienced the struggle and actually laying it out for them in a way that is really unique um, from my experience and from an indigenous experience. That, and a lot of them never heard that before in general. So I do agree that there's definitely like this embodiment of... of of what we're doing, not for the sake of presenting our ideas to white people, mm-hmm. not for the sake of academic speak, but to simply just like hold space as indigenous people doing cool things and, and maintaining this, um, the uh, real relationship with who we are and where we come from. Because I feel like, especially looking at your work, you're not compromising who you are. No. If, if anything, you're really... Um, un, um, you're really opening up into who you really are, into who you truly are, and, 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 and positioning yourself in that. And being honest with that is really uh, cool to see. And I think young people need to see that more. Yeah, like writing, like writing erotica is not all that I do. <laughs> it's not all that I write. Mm-hmm. And, but it's an entry point, and it's an entry point that a lot of people can connect with. Yeah. Desire. Mm-hmm. Like, we all experience versions of desire. Mm -hmm. And, yes, not all of it has to be sensual or sexual. Mm -hmm. But we all want at some point in our life. And I think people connect with that idea. Yeah. And then, I don't know what we're talking about. I just, like, stuck in my head now being like, oh, that's a really good line. (laughs) 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 Writer problems. Sorry. (laughs) For, For our listeners, we're actually sitting in Saskatoon. Um, it's 10 p.m. and this is the only time that we uh, <laughs> had to actually record this podcast. But we're like both drinking tea and coffee. We're both drinking tea and like, coffee. No but fucks it, given. It, yeah, but it also doesn't work on us because we've been PhD students for like ever. So. I don't get people who are like, <laughs> I can't drink a coffee after two. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, like the 5 p.m. coffee is a real thing for us. Right, well, for it's, me, like it's like <laughs> 9.30 p.m. I'm like, a shot of espresso, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we came back around to talking about, um, um, and you mentioned your indigenous erotica, and erotica as, as a field that you're studying. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and that's really cool. I, th- I don't think, a, like, I find, like, a lot of undergrads don't realize that when you actually get past, like, the things you, you have to know, like, the mm-hmm. requirements, that you could start to do things that other people aren't doing. I know. Like, like educational background history. I have a BA. Do I have a BA? I have a BA. <laughs> in uh english and uh it was supposed to be a double major but there's just too much native studies Mm -hmm. and then like a minor in native studies and then i have an mfa in creative writing Mm -hmm. and then i doing this phd in indigenous literature slash indigenous erotica in english Mm -hmm. but the first two years like the first year first two years of a phd in indigenous literature we still have to take like a wide array of classes mm-hmm. and we still have to get a ground route. And then we do these things called comps yeah. and have to read a hundred books in our field, basically. And as much as I bitched about that, like I didn't realize how much I needed that foundational mm-hmm. set of knowledge. Yeah. Like you mentioned Gerald Visner, he's on my list and mm-hmm. I'm like, Oh, I feel smart because <laughs> blah, I know who you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> And it's that little thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, PhDs are this this very elite club mm-hmm. that often have these, like you said, barriers and boundaries that we have no idea about, especially as first generation. Mm-hmm. And it's things like when to apply for a shirk. Yeah. What the fuck is a shirk? Yeah. <laughs> is it a vegetable? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Did you say shirt? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. 
And it's those little things or how to apply for scholarships or mm-hmm. how do you get correct references? Like it's not just asking yeah. for someone now to say you can work in a retail store yeah. and how to maintain professional relationships, but how to build friendships out yeah. of professional relationships. Yeah. And when do you do that? Mm-hmm. Like all these things that we have to stumble through. Yeah. Oh, that's so true. Like, like, I always tell undergrads that everything they learn is like knowledge times two because you have to learn the Western world and how they're saying things and you have to learn how that relates to you and your people. Like what's our belief system around that? But I like how you said that PhDs, like our generation I find, I know there's PhDs before us who, you know, even some of them even breeze through PhDs. Yeah. But I mean, for us, it's almost as if like we're in a social political world that um, I find is very challenging to navigate. And... I don't think like PhDs in Canada in particular, like PhD programs aren't the best they can be yet. Oh no, not yeah. at all. Um, I, I, I'm not going to pick on my program. Like I said, I'm still registered in it, mm-hmm. but in an imaginary program, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my subtleness is not working at 10 PM. <laughs> I'll, I'll use this example. Cause it's like, it's thrown me off my game for many a years. Mm-hmm. But in my program, there is a language requirement. Mm -hmm. And to facilitate this, the university offered a speaking French class for three credits. You take this class, you pass it, you're done your language requirement. And I was like, okay, cool. I have six credits of Cree from back in the day. Mm -hmm. I was like, does that count? They're like, well, no. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, You have to have it at a second year level speaking. And I'm like, okay, so I have Cree 110. So then I have to take Cree 120. And then I have to take a Cree 200 level. Mm -hmm. So I need 18 credit units Mm -hmm. to match this three units of French. And we, you know, and I was, we had a meeting about it because Mm -hmm. I was like, this is unfair. This is unjust. This is problematic. I tried not to use the R word and I'm, I don't think it's still worked out in a favor that I'm happy with. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's even those little nuances like, well, we're helping you. Like, this is three credit units of French. And I'm like, I've literally never spoken any French in my life. My Mm -hmm. high school, my elementary, we spoke Cree. Like, I say that. I'm not fluent. I'm not fluent. (laughs) Like, like, Namoya, no fluent. (laughs) But it was a Métis Cree town. Like, that's Mm -hmm. what we took. So it's like all these things that are supposed to assist Mm -hmm. all PhD students don't assist us all and if i wasn't like if i was bipoc other than indigenous from this land you know i'd be like okay i might i might gravitate and be like this Mm -hmm. is a great way to get through this but i'm like we should be able to offer at this level indigenous languages at this level yeah and they should be accessible Mm -hmm. and they're not yeah they're not totally yeah I agree. And that's an, that's an interesting, interesting story to hear for sure, because I find like undergraduate level, I mean, sure, it's it's good. I think we do a good job with indigenous undergrads at some universities, at some tribal colleges, for sure. Masters, I mean, there's a lot of master students now. We could get through those two-year programs. But like, yeah, like you said, the PhD is just like there's subtleties in it that aren't meeting the needs of, of indigenous students. Mm -hmm. and there's still lots of work to be done in them and even now like you and i I think we can both joke about it being in positions of privilege like you have work outside the university Mm -hmm. your name isn't built on you being an academic student Mm -hmm. same as me you know i have a business i have a blog i have books you know Mm -hmm. me being a university student is a passion (laughs) yeah but it's not fundamental so we have a privilege of being critical of the systems we're in Mm -hmm. not all students have that exactly and, you know, my professor might, like, hear this one day and be like, Tyndale, and I'll be like, where's the lie? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. We could always do better. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Don't fire us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All I'm saying is we could always do better. <laughs> yeah, that's true, though. But, but even that assessment of saying, oh, we, we have access to, like, a job or my contract work or me working at mm-hmm. the local school, a lot of that came from the fact that I couldn't survive doing just doing the phd Mm -hmm. yeah like i i couldn't survive just dedicating 100 percent to that and you see non-native students 
spend like 24 seven in the library. And the only time I could do that was when I was an undergrad and when I was in a two years master's program, probably through my PhD coursework, I could, but then when the bills started piling up, when life started to happen, it's like, I can't do this full time right now, but I'm still a full time PhD student, right. of course. But I mean, so much of my time goes to my community, goes to my mental health, goes to my literal finances. And I think like even if you just took my whole timeline of, of me being a six year PhD student, if you just like chop that up into the actual time where I was consciously intentionally doing the PhD it would be half that time. And the other half would be just trying to pay my bills. Mm -hmm. right? Because I mean, yearly rent in, in Saskatoon wasn't working out for us, which is why we had to move to real Saskatchewan where rent was cheaper mm -hmm. and it's saving us tons of money. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I don't have access to the university, but I mean, we're in COVID time, so it doesn't matter, but still like those, those assessments and those decisions are coming directly from the fact that PhD programs need a bit more work. Yeah, completely. Yeah. Like even at the beginning when everything was like hunky dory, it still wasn't hunky dory mm -hmm. because I was like, you know, for listeners who don't understand, um, often when you get a PhD, it comes with funding. Um, often it's not enough, <laughs> yeah. but there's opportunities to make it up things that we've learned. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I was a single mom. Mm -hmm. I was, I came into this as a single mom with a three year old on my hip mm -hmm. and who's now nine. Oh my God. And, you know, we had daycare, we had rent, we had truck payments, mm -hmm. we had insurance, we had groceries and, you know, at one point someone in my life was like oh you're making the same amount i made when i was a phd student you can do this and i'm like you were a phd student 20 years ago <laughs> yeah yeah like are you kidding me yeah you were single you had no obligation outside yourself mm -hmm. and i wish i had the luxury i wish mm -hmm. you know if i wasn't taking care of my business yeah you know yes this would have been done yeah. years ago Yes, yeah. call me doctor, whatever. Mm -hmm. But that's not that's not our normal. That's not yeah. our everyday. Yeah, especially for indigenous students, because life happens and life doesn't happen. We lose people. Oh, um, for real. And we're in Saskatchewan. Like when I was in like third, fourth year, of my PhD, um, there was the shooting death of Colton Bushi. Mm -hmm. All right, and one degree of kinship away from him, um, that was that took a lot of time for me to process and dedicate time to my sister Jade. Mm -hmm. um, who is on this podcast and will be in on this podcast in the future or maybe we played her already i don't know where i'm positioning it but yeah that was a very tough thing to navigate on top of the loss of my father and my grandmother during my phd um and even having a daughter now like mm -hmm. so me being a father now all this happens in that span um one of my professors or one of my mentors i look up to said that phds get a tough rap because life ha tends to happen at that age which is true but then they don't accommodate that. <laughs> like it's not like accommodating those those life changes that tend to happen in your late twenties, early thirties. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, like funding doesn't equal a salary, right? At all. Yeah, it doesn't at equal all. a salary at all. And I and I heard some numbers. Uh, I heard some rumors of numbers that PhDs make in the course of a six year program, and it's still pretty low. I mean, on the funding scale, people be like, wow, that's how much you, we, we dedicate to you while you made. But then when you look at that and compare that to a salary, it's like you may not even be there for some tenure profs mm -hmm. you know, over the course of six years. I know. And it doesn't. Yeah, I know. I think about like, the last six years of my life and so much has happened. Like I've been very, very blessed that nothing's happened to me. Yeah. But around me, like mm -hmm. just like these shock waves of event after event, national mm -hmm. events have yeah. affected me. Yeah. And, you know, you don't you don't get time off because your best friend had a tragedy in her life yeah. that you're there for. Mm -hmm. You know, like you don't you don't get that. Mm -hmm. You don't get that. Whereas I think like in indigenous circles, like, yeah, you get that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you get that. Do you need do you need food? Do you need someone to pick up your kid? Do you need yeah. Like, how can I help you yeah. so you can be there for them? Mm -hmm. That is not, you know, an academic policy. But let's also be critical. Should it be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. I think I think there's good individuals, right? There's good individuals. There's good profs for sure. Oh, yeah. 
But that doesn't tr individuals don't translate to an overall system very well because that overall system has its way of doing things, and that's mm -hmm. how academia is. Like we could have an awesome prof or advisor that's one hundred percent supportive, yes. But that whole structure is still going to put those barriers and limit the potential that we have simply by us being indigenous, simply by us having a different worldview. And again, that life happens and don't happen concept tends to happen a lot for indigenous people. I find right because we're still under oppressed circumstances. We're still dealing with communities that aren't. Um, in the best situations. I know. Mm -hmm. Like, I taught for the first time last year. What a great time to teach. Like, my own class. Yeah. Because I was avoiding it um, for the longest time because I didn't want, A, that responsibility because yeah. it's a lot. And, B, you know, the book had come out. I was busy. Like, yeah. I can go on a weekend away in Toronto and mm -hmm. make more money than the, what they'd pay. Yeah. <laughs> like, let's be real. Yep. Yeah. So I said no for the longest time because I had other opportunities. And I was like, you know what? Let's just do this. It's a safe place to learn. You know, you have a lot of support to make your mistakes. And one of the things I implemented, and I'm not sure the university agreed with me. I was just like, if you're sick, you're sick. Stay home. Nobody mm -hmm. wants you here when you're sick. Please don't mm -hmm. come. Um, I don't need a medical note. If you have a, if you need a mental health day, you need a mental health day. Yeah. I'm like, as long as you let me know, you won't be there. Mm -hmm. And you make up a way to like get the notes. That's it. Cool. I was like, because there had been so many times in my undergrad where I had to like bear my soul yeah. to get like an excused absent. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm sorry. Like, I'm I'm just not ready to put my kids through that trauma. Yeah. And I was like, my kids. I was like, calm down. To you. Like, they're <laughs> adults. Some of them are older than <laughs> you. But I was like, no, they're my kids. Yeah. And. That was just like one of those little things that I took from being an undergrad and having to perform yeah. all this indigenous grief to earn time yeah, off. For sure. And I was just like, we're not doing that. We're not doing that this year. Yeah. Yeah. I've been in those situations and, and I hate the comeback that a lot of emotionally unintelligent academics have where it's like it gets into the trauma stories <sighs> where it's like, oh, well, when I was doing my PhD or, oh, back in 1980s or 1990s, and it's like, okay, cool. But now we're here. You know? <laughs> now we're in 2020 or 2015 or 2014. And it's like, just because you suffer doesn't mean everyone else has to. It's a weird, weird fetish a lot of these old academics have where they want young people to suffer for some reason. Oh my God. Like, I'm not working this hard for my kid to go through suffering. Yeah. I'm not working. This, like, no, we're not doing this for that. Yeah. The reality with kids, too, especially me having a daughter now, I'm realizing she doesn't care what happens in my day. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, sorry, I'm like old parent here, nine years old, <laughs> like new parent. My new parent. Like I have no sympathy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like I I mean that in a way where like if I go home and I just chill and be present with her, she doesn't care if I had a good day or a bad day. She mm -hmm. doesn't care how much work I got done or haven't got done. It's just she'll remember me being there at the end of the day. Yep. And that really like stands out to me now because it really allowed me just to be present with myself and, and what, I've, what I'm capable of doing and not doing. And so far, fatherhood has been an amazing, uh, smooth experience for me because I do have a really supportive, loving um, partner who's a natural mother and concentrates on motherhood. I do love her. Yeah, and her whole art is on based on motherhood. So we have this really shared consciousness around parenting. And um, yeah, but... That's what really amazes me and I think really like got me more motivated to finish my PhD and just to push through in some cases because at the end of the day, I still go home and I'm there and, and sh as long as I'm there, she's happy with that. You're very lucky. Thank you. Oh, like, Erin and I were talking about this because I've been in school as long as she's kind of had memory. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and... She has very little memories of me playing with her, mm. doing things with her, like going to the park, biking, feeding the dogs. Mm -hmm. Cool, 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 cool. But sitting down and like playing Barbies mm. or building a house or playing Legos, like playing mm -hmm. very little because I don't have time. Yeah. And I'm not saying that dismissively. I'm saying like as someone who's writing a thesis, as someone who's like preparing for yeah. comps, as so, like, and as a single parent. Like, I don't have time to play with my kid. Yeah. And I remember being so grateful when she grew to the age where she's super self-reliant, like only kid problems, where now she knows how to entertain herself and like read a book and do the coloring and like all these things by herself. She's super content. And I remember being like so grateful. Mm -hmm. 
And I was like talking to my mom about this. And I was just like, like, it's super sad that she's not going to have a childhood of like play with me. Mm-hmm. But hopefully it'll be a childhood now of like stories and adventure. Yeah. Like, oh, so yeah. you're very lucky. Don't ever take that for granted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and for me, like for me, like I think my life is more of a I'm more conscious. I'm really make, like I make conscious choices about that. Like if I don't make a conscious choice, I may not do that. Or if I yeah. don't make a conscious choice and actually think about this and, and intentionally put this out there, I may get, you know, distracted or fall into um, some cycles of doom or into certain um, toxic work, ac- work ethic. Because there is a lot of toxic work ethic, I find. Oh, yeah. Completely. Yeah. And people don't really have those conversations because we're assumed to work till we're broken. And I don't agree with that at all. I know. I found, like, <laughs> this is going to sound insane, but I found going into the PhD was in a lot of ways a vacation because I own my own business. Yeah. So, I mean, I have to set my own hours, but I had no (laughs) self-control because, you know, I got to get it done. I got to work hard. I got to, like, do this well. And I felt like once I stopped working for myself and now started working for, like, this other goal that someone else had to assign to me, I was like, oh, I can, like, breathe a little. Mm. You know, I don't have to work till 2 a.m. Yeah. I don't have to get up at 6 Mm a.m. Like, I can sleep more than five hours. Mm -hmm. What? Yeah. Totally. This... I love this conversation we had about PhDs and, and grad school and academia in general because I feel like there is this assumption that we have to be grateful. <laughs> we right? have to be grateful and that we're in a privileged <laughs> space. You're privileged to be there. And it's true, we are. Yeah. But I don't think growth happens in those spaces as much as they can. And, you know, looking at, you know, PhD programs in university, looking at um, some, of PH, some PhDs and professors I look up to um, in New Zealand and Hawaii, they come at it from a different consciousness, like, and, and I really learned a lot from that. And, mm. and part of it is, like, I really want to embody uh, who I am as a scholar, who am I as an uh, academic, even though I don't really call myself that, as an indigenous person in general. Like, well, how does that relate to me on, the, on, on these deeper levels? And part of it, I think, is just us having these very open conversations about the struggles we're having. Because a lot of people don't. And, I, and, I, and that really bugs me because I think we position ourselves too professional sometimes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and the lingo that sort of shows up in interviews or at conferences or when you're in the media is a, it, for some people, like when I observe it, I'm like, oh, that's the professional lingo. <laughs> and we really don't talk like that, you know, <laughs> when, when the cameras aren't there. We really don't talk like that after we're done at the academic conferences, right? And that's why I loved your work. Like wh- when, I, when I first saw what you were writing and I, when I first saw you um, uh, read your poems, I was like, okay, I know what she's doing, right? Because people are hearing the sexuality of it but then just the unsettling of that conversation is really exposing us to the conversations we do have, right? Mm-hmm. The conversations that do happen and, and the humor that does exist in our circles. And, um, and yeah, that doesn't really translate to the professional conversations at all. Yeah, having Indian love poems emerge in the middle of a PhD mm-hmm. has definitely invited awkward conversations not on my end like whatever (laughs) let's talk but awkward moments um especially as as well you know a phd like you're a student Mm -hmm. but you're training to be a professor Mm -hmm. you know so one day like the professors hopefully one day will be your colleagues yeah but there's still the boundary yeah (laughs) and there i come (laughs) You know, fuck that boundary, literally. (laughs) We'll save that one for another podcast. (laughs) Yes, exactly. (laughs) And just disrupting all this. And it's it's about power. It's definitely about power. Like as an indigenous female taking that power and taking that conversation and Mm -hmm. starting that conversation in the way I want to start it. But I've also noticed it when it's turned on its head. Yeah. You know, I've been introduced at academic events because you know indian love poems is an award-winning collection yeah which is hysterically funny to me but it is yeah so you know i've been introduced as like oh the sexiest phd student like at official events (laughs) by old white men wow and i'm like not for you yeah (laughs) like this is a nuanced conversation that you can listen to yeah but this is not for you. And on that, in that sense, it's a very intelligent conversation that they're not picking up on. Right. Yeah. 
Like, if you don't see the problem of calling one of your PhD students sexy, yeah, uh, you need some work. Yeah, exactly. That that really speaks to like I think academia in general, all white Western academia that we clash with constantly. Do you feel like you could have that if you weren't in a PhD, Indian love poems would have been written? That's a whole conversation. <laughs> yeah, because you were talking about how like we were in this space and you're in the spaces of PhD. There's struggles. There's this thing, and then one of the things you wanted to do was to disrupt that conversation. And disrupt that, you know, normal seed of, of sort of being stuck in that. And then all of a sudden, Indian Love Poem comes up and is a very decolonial book. Very unsettling book in a good way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't... Blah, blah, blah. Indian Love Poems came out of, like, a breakup. Mm. And of the healing that came both physically and emotionally from yeah. that. And had nothing to do with my PhD. Mm, interesting. But Indian Love Poems probably wouldn't have been printed or taken note of, if not for the activities in my PhD, where people saw that I was writing and invited me to perform these poems. So, like, they're connected, but in no way did I ever mean for them to connect. Because at at that time, I was still very much, I'm not going to say a blushing, bashful person, because let's be real, but I was still very uncomfortable with the idea of being a public face for yeah. indigenous erotica. Mm-hmm. It's interesting because I always associated Indian love poems with you being an English major. And I just assumed in my head that, oh, she's probably, that's like, cool. Structurally, she's doing something. <laughs> no. So it's interesting for you to say that. And it's also interesting because for me, how, this, this conversation we just had and everything we've been unpacking, for me, the work you've done with Indian love poems and the work you've been facilitating just in terms of, um, changing, you know, social circles mm-hmm. and society because your book is doing that. Yeah. That is coming out of, like, for me, that is what a PhD should be doing, like an indigenous PhD should be doing. And I get it. And I get that aspect of it for yeah. sure. Like, I'm definitely influenced. Like, this book has influenced my PhD yeah. completely. It's mm-hmm. changed it completely. But it also stands apart. Like, yeah. it was born apart. It was born... Mm-hmm. You know, in shadowy bedrooms. It was born behind closed doors. It was born in the giggling of one indigenous woman to another. Yeah. And I don't want it to be an academic book in any way. Yeah, yeah. Like, I want it to be for us, from us, to us. Cool. Yeah. Do you feel like academia, um, because you said, interestingly, um, you got introduced to academic conferences for Indian Love Poems. Yeah. Do you think there's a fusion taking place with that work in your academics right now? Completely. Yeah. And I've accepted it. <laughs> At this point, I've accepted it. I've made it work for me and I've embraced it. But that wouldn't be for everyone. Yeah. Right? Like, not everyone is going to be comfortable with that. But, I mean, I'm not alone. Mm-hmm. Like, as I blank out, like Leanne Simpson, mm-hmm. um, Kim Tall, Kim, what's her name? Kim Tallbear. There we go. Kim yeah. Tallbear. Love her. Tracy Bear. Yeah. Like there's many, many aunties before me who have done this work in various forms. Mm-hmm. I just think I did it at a time of social media. Yeah. You know, you did it at a time of social media, but you also did it in a way that was pretty explicit. <laughs> 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 yeah. It's pretty explicit. I remember like one time walking into your readings on campus and there was like an academic audience <laughs> and you were just like <laughs> dropping these poems back to back. And you could literally see like people adjusting their collars and adjusting in their seats. And I was like, oh, I love this because it is disrupting like a lot of comfort zones for people in a very good way because we we do need to experience discomfort to decolonize. Oh, my goodness. I remember this one time. That's how I met like a couple of my favorite people. Um, I was in Chilliwack and I got introduced at this event because my book had just dropped. It wasn't present yet. So this must have been like April. My book was at the end of April. Anyways, so just before that, I had to give a talk, Mm -hmm. an academic 10-minute talk on something. And it was like academic. Mm -hmm. And it was fine. And I did it, whatever. And then right after that, I got introduced and invited to do a poetry reading. And at that time, like my two conversations did not meld very well, right? Mm -hmm. So I went from like, Blah 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 <laughs> to like blah blah blah. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> and uh, I just started like dropping these like erotic love poems. Yeah. And uh, my favorite, Daniel Heath Justice, a professor out at UBC, yeah. um, was in the front row. And he has like the loudest anti laugh of us all. Yeah. And he was losing his shit. Yeah. Like, never heard of me before. And all of a sudden I'm up there talking about like dick and tongue. And he's yeah, like, yeah. yes, yeah. <laughs> losing his shit. And right behind him um, was another professor of ours, Sam. Well, not ours. I didn't know him at the time, but he's a blonde, blue eyed man, mm-hmm. a white man. And there's a couple of poems in my book about making love to a white guy. Mm-hmm. And at the time, I had no idea who these two professors were. And I was like, and like talking about me and love to a white boy. I'm like, oh, hey, cutie, you in the pink shirt. What's up? Mm-hmm. Like, I've never seen a white man turn red so fast. <laughs> like, completely <laughs> blushing. Everybody howling. And he just like got redder and redder and redder as I read more explicit love poems. Yeah. So at the end, I introduced myself. And now we're like, we're all amazing friends. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but like, there was that definite moment of like, who is this person? Yeah. Like, what is she doing? I can't believe she said that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing work. And I mean, um, I assume that a lot of the the, uh, indigenous community has read your work or is aware of it. But if people aren't, they definitely need to get your book and and look into it. Um, I've seen, um, yeah, I've seen like a lot of academia in general kind of just begin to um, meet our generation on our on our level like meet younger generation on their level of social media on their level of you know what we want to write about and how we mm-hmm, want to write about mm-hmm. things like there's definitely a transition taking place in terms of um how we're choosing to live in modernity and in these times so what's your advice for like um people who are listening to this who are saying yeah we do have a new wave of scholars coming up and how could we meet their needs better i think it's just about being open um and listening to what we want and how we mm-hmm. need to do it and kind of understanding again we talk about this but like our privilege mm-hmm. as scholars and being like things that we take for granted mm-hmm. how to apply for events what events what grants what scholarships mm-hmm. um using our privilege aka our wealth to assist first and second year grad students mm-hmm. in going to these conferences once they start happening yeah. Like, I don't know about you, but <laughs> like I've I've had to pay money multiple yeah. times. Yeah. And we shouldn't mm-hmm. like we're the poorest of the poor. We're grad students. Yeah. Why are we doing this? Mm-hmm. So I think it's just about being open, listening to what's said and to what's not being yeah. said. Yeah. What's not being said is a big thing because we're sometimes in spaces where we can't say what needs to be said. Mm hmm. Um, and yeah, we're regulated or we're um, marginalized for even saying what needs to be said, right? Yeah, because like talking to conferences, I remember Kim Talbert mm-hmm. in November um, had a conference in Edmonton. And I really wanted to go. It was like right up my alley, Indigenous erotica, Indigenous work, matriarch work, Indigenous mm-hmm. feminism. I'm like, yes, let's go. I had no money. Yeah. And I was just like, oh, it's too late to like organize photography work out there. Yeah. But I'm just going to like bite the bullet. I'm going to borrow some money. I'm going to go. And then Kim heard that I wanted to go. And yeah. she's like, how can we make this happen? So she invited me to speak at TP Confessions out there. So mm. got me a gig, paid me that, paid me gas money, paid me a hotel, mm-hmm. made sure meals were covered. Wow. And like she did all this out of her budget just to help because she knew my situation. Yeah. Like I've never had an indigenous scholar, any scholar, take care of me in such a way. Wow. And then we got snowed in <laughs> because it's calgary yeah. in edmonton and we got snowed in the next night and she was just like no problem i'll get you a hotel like wow. that should be the norm yeah that shouldn't be like the story of like the one excellent professor who took care of us yeah that should be the norm true yeah true and i, and I think a lot of grad students would agree with you for that uh, agree with you with uh, uh bah, getting tired i think a lot of grad <laughs> students would agree with you for sure in terms of how you put that yeah cool well thanks for spending time for me uh we're getting tired (laughs) you're so tired (laughs) thanks for spending time with me thanks for making time to do the radical narrative podcast radical narrative podcast we really try to get to the core conversations that people don't normally have and conversations that ultimately lead to growth right so hopefully yeah so we're hoping that you know people like this and if you like it um um 
subscribe to the podcast, share it, let people know that we're having this, and check out our website, www.radicalnarrative.com. Uh, link some information to Tanil in the show notes. And yeah, thanks for having us. Any closing shout outs you want to give? I apologize to everyone if I brutalized your name. I love you. It's late. <laughs> it's late. The <laughs> academic expose is is necessary, though. <laughs> it is needed. It is needed. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, Daniel. I appreciate it. And yeah, we'll talk soon again. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.